Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at HK's Grey Room in Ashburn, Virginia, taking a look at a bunch of their interesting historical firearms. And in particular today, we're going to look at the whole family of HK P7 pistols. Now this actually started out as the HK PSP, or a Police Self-Loading Pistol. Uh, it acquired the designation P7 when it was formally adopted by the, well, a couple of German state police agencies. In fact, that's where the design originated. The, the German state police agencies wanted a new sidearm, and uh, they put together a, a they put out a call for uh, new pistol designs. And in 1976, HK started work on this project. Uh, the testing was actually done in 1978, and HK in this testing was competing against Walther, Mauser, and Sig Sauer. Um, and in the end. It, this is kind of interesting. Contrary to a military test, where the most, the most common outcome of a military small arms test is nothing gets adopted, and in best case they'll pick one gun and adopt it. Well, this was a combined test by and for state police forces, but there were a whole bunch of different agencies. And at the end of the test, they concluded that three of the four guns submitted were actually just fine, good to go. Which is why we ended up with the Walther P5, the Sig Sauer P6, and the HK P7. All three of these were approved, and then it was left up to each individual agency to pick which one of them they might want to have. Now, the P7 came out best in most of the tests. I think it could be easily regarded as the most successful, uh, the best technological gun of that testing. However, it was also the most expensive. And as a result, uh, it was only adopted by a couple of agencies, the primary one being the Bavarian State Police. A lot of the other agencies uh, looked at the test results and concluded that some of these cheaper pistols worked just perfectly sufficiently for their needs, and adopted those instead. So uh, if we look at our timeline, 1978, uh, the testing is concluded, and, and a couple German agencies start adopting the gun. It then goes through military testing. The German military tests it in 1980. The American military actually tests it in 1981 as part of the project that would eventually adopt the Beretta 92. And uh, the Austrian military tested it in 1983. Now the Austrians ended up adopting the Glock, which was a domestic Austrian design. But the, the process of, uh, of going through all of these tests and seeing what some of these military users were really looking for in a gun led to a number of design changes, and that led to the P7M8 and the P7M13. So uh, let's go ahead and take a closer look. We will start by looking at the mechanical aspects of the gun, because those don't really change through this whole cycle. And then we'll take a look at the developmental history of the gun, and, and how it evolved from the early PSP through the final uh, P7M13 plan. We'll start with a basic P7 here to go through some of the fundamentals of the gun. These are in 9 by 19 parabellum caliber. They are single stack pistols, uh, 8 round capacity. That would change with the M13, but we'll get to that later. Uh, they are a gas delayed uh, blowback mechanism, which is quite unusual. I, I can't say unique. There are a couple other guns on the market that do this. And very interestingly, I actually found a patent on this concept dating all the way back to, I think it was 1910, by Ole Craig of the Craig Jorgensen, which is particularly interesting. At any rate, that patent was long expired by the time HK uh, did this, so it's not like they were infringing on anything. And then maybe the most unusual, uh, and this as far as I can think of, is a unique feature in the gun, and that is the squeeze cocking system. Where uh, this is the safety, and it also contributes to a nice trigger pull, and it's a really clever idea. Basically, in a striker fired pistol, uh, you, have, you have to pull the striker back you know, a, a certain amount, and then release it so that it has enough spring pressure behind it to get shot forward fast enough to detonate a primer when it hits. And there are a couple different ways this is done. One of the tricks is you need to keep the thing safe. So what you get with a gun like a Glock is uh, the striker is automatically recocked about halfway uh, by the slide closing, and then the other half of its travel is provided by the trigger. So that if for some reason the striker slips, when you haven't pulled the trigger and goes forward, it doesn't go forward fast enough to actually fire a cartridge. 
The problem with that is it means you have to fight the firing the striker spring to pull the striker back. And that's why Glocks never have really great triggers. Uh, the difference is on, for example, on a hammer fired gun, you can recock the hammer. It's got all of the energy it needs to wound up in there, and all you have to do is pull a sear uh, out of the way perpendicular to the spring force, and then it'll slam forward and fire. And you can get a really nice trigger pull, is the point I'm getting at. What HK did on this is they have, in its resting state like this, the striker is all the way forward. So it's, it's acting just like a hammer-fired gun with the hammer down. There's no chance of this thing firing uh, when it's in this, uh, in this state, even if there's a cartridge in the chamber. When you squeeze the front strap back like this, that takes a decent amount of effort. You can see that uh, the indicator comes back when you do it. This is actually retracting the striker back to its full travel. So when you do this and then pull the trigger, you get a nice light trigger pull. It's a little creepy still, because it is striker fired. But you get a much lighter trigger pull than most striker fired guns. Um, and, and, and that's all you have to do. You don't have to use the trigger to pull the striker back, just to release it. And then, as long as I'm holding this lever down, when the action cycles, it once again holds the striker all the way back, ready at its release point, and I have another very nice trigger pull. So what you get here is basically a striker fired gun with a single action trigger. And they go one step farther than that. The gun does of course lock open on an empty magazine, like so. And in order to drop the magazine, they, they've actually built that functionality into that squeeze front strap as well. So when you're reloading this gun, it locks open, you pull the mag out, you put the mag in, there's no need to have an extra control up here. You'll notice there is nothing up on the slide. There's no safety, there's no decocker, there's no bolt release or slide release, because all of that is built into this front squeeze, the, the front strap squeeze cocking lever. Um, you may have noticed this button. That's actually a disassembly button, so we'll get to that in a minute. So this is a pretty unorthodox system. It definitely takes some getting used to, and I think it's a big part of why the guns never became really super popular, is this is just weird and alien to a lot of American gun owners. But it has some really interesting and really cool advantages. Um, I will point out one other thing, which is, and this has, uh, this is something that people noticed, and, and a lot of people I think attributed to being a, a design defect, but this was actually done deliberately. You can, if you hold the trigger, you can fire the gun with the front strap. We can go ahead and get a closer look at exactly how that's working internally by using this cool cutaway gun with transparent grips. Uh, however, before we look at it up close, I want to point out one other cool little engineering quirk in here. Namely, this thing has a 110 degree grip angle, which HK thinks is, is ideal, and certainly a lot of people find very comfortable. However, that grip angle isn't necessarily all that conducive to proper reliable feeding of the magazine. You want the magazine as close to vertical as you can. Well, in this thing, the magazine is actually sitting at a much squarer angle to the gun than the grip is. The grip is long enough here that they were able to design the magazine in such a way um, that, that the magazine is actually kind of rotated around like this. And so you get both the best of both. You're able to get a sharper grip angle that they wanted, while also having a, a more squared up uh, magazine presentation. All right, let's take a closer look now at how this actually works. This silver colored piece here is the sear, and that darker uh, triangular looking piece right there is uh, the edge, the, the uh, sear surface of the striker. So when I squeeze the grip in, I am cocking the striker all the way back. When I pull the trigger, it's going to drop this piece, which releases the striker and goes forward. Now, when I, I'll release the trigger, so this will come back up. When the gun cycles, you'll notice this is the, the sear is going to pop back up in line with the striker, and it's going to recock it as long as I'm holding the, uh, the front strap in. And then I can fire again. If I release the front strap, now this goes forward. 
to a position where it's matched up with the striker being all the way home. So if I recock the pistol now, you can see the striker stays in that at rest position. And it's only when I squeeze the grip, it comes back, and now it's in a position ready to fire. And the reason that this also works the other direction is because if I hold the trigger down, this will drop as soon as it reaches the end of its travel. So if I'm holding the trigger and then I squeeze the grip, it's going to pull it all the way back, drop, and fire. So that's the striker mechanism. The other interesting half of this is the gas delay system. I think that is actually better explained with a complete gun than the cutaway. So we'll go ahead and pull this apart. Um, it's easy enough to do. You just hold the button down, pull the slide back, and lift it up. And there we go. Off the front of the gun. Recoil spring frame. Note that because this is delayed blowback, it's able to have a fixed barrel, which is one of the things that contributes to this being a particularly accurate model of pistol. And then there is a second hole beneath the barrel. That hole exists for this gas piston, which is pinned to the front of the slide. When this thing is all assembled, it lines up right about like this, and this piston is in this pressurized chamber right down here. There's a hole in the bottom of the barrel. In fact, you can see a hole there. When they manufactured this, they drill through the top before they put the barrel in. Uh, so there's a matching hole here, right in the bottom of the barrel, just in front of the chamber. When you fire, uh, gas, in addition to pushing the bullet forward, also drops into this chamber underneath the barrel, pressurizes it, and that pushes forward on this gas piston, which in turn pushes the slide forward. Uh, what you get here is uh, basically as long as the bullet's in the barrel, you have a lot of gas pressure pushing forward and holding the slide closed. Now it will start to slowly open up, but because it's opening against a lot of pressure, uh, it doesn't actually open sufficiently to cause an issue until the bullet has left the barrel and pressure in the barrel has dropped. It's a really clever, interesting system. Now it does have some downsides, namely you're going to, uh, you're going to kind of create a heat sink right here. That lower uh, pressure chamber is going to get quite hot, because just like the barrel, it's always full of very hot, very high pressure gas. And it's located right here, just above the trigger guard. So on these guns, with extended firing, the trigger and the top of the trigger guard area tend to get pretty hot fairly quickly. Again, rather like the barrel does. You can see some of these features in the cutaway as well. Now that you know what to look for, you can see there's the gas port right there. Uh, note that this does also have a fluted chamber, uh, because again it's a, a blowback firearm. Those flutes help uh, reduce, help accom accommodate for relatively high extraction pressure. Anyway, gas goes through that port. It's going to come down here into this chamber right there, and you can see the front of the piston there. If I flip the gun over, you can see the, the main body of the piston there. So that is the standard uh, PSP, uh, HK's internal designation, Police Semi-Automatic Pistol, uh, which became adopted by the German government as the P7, Pistol 7. Um, and this is what was adopted by most of the German uh, police agencies. As the P7 pistol went through some additional trials with other organizations, namely the German, American, and Austrian militaries, uh, there were a couple of complaints that came up. Of course, the heat was one, and the magazine release was another. And in 1981, uh, HK released an improved, or, or at least a, a modified and changed version, which it called the P7 M8. Now that M8 indicates that it is still a single stack magazine with an eight round capacity, and the first user to, to actually trial this out was the New Jersey State Police. And the big thing that they wanted was a more traditional magazine release. They didn't like the heel mounted release of the standard P7. Uh, here in the US this has always been regarded kind of as a European thing um, that, that we sort of take pride in not doing. The rationalization for this is that this is typically a very secure magazine release. It doesn't release accidentally, and it is uh, quite conducive to maintaining control of magazines. This has always been an important thing 
for most military pistols, where they're generally only issued with one or two magazines, and you don't want to just go dropping magazines on the ground willy-nilly. So HK moved the release on the M8 model to right here, right behind the trigger guard, where we are used to having our button magazine release. However, this isn't actually a button. The M8 maintained its ambidexterity by having this release lever on both sides, and the way it works is you actually push it down. Like so. And it releases the magazine out. Uh, these magazines are not interchangeable with the P7, uh, the standard P7, because these have a magazine catch up here, where the P7 has a hole in the magazine in the back. There's the catch on a, an original early pattern P7 mag, as opposed to that on the M8. Now this control would be much more interesting, much more uh, appealing to a lot of US agencies, and also some military agencies. And this would go on to be the standard through the rest of production. However, I think it's worth pointing out that it does have downsides, and they're exactly the downsides that uh, HK knew about when they originally went with the heel release. There would be issues over time of these occasionally accidentally releasing, if the magazine catch was bumped by something, particularly when uh, drawing or holstering the pistol. It's not that difficult to bump that drop your magazine out. Not that it happens a lot, but it is a legitimate issue. Uh, in addition, in order to quell some of the, the problems, the complaints about the guns uh, getting too hot, HK added a, uh, a thicker plastic trigger and this piece of plastic at the top of the trigger guard. Uh, it's really a very simple modification, and it just acts as an insulator. Think of that as a little tiny handguard that is less uh, less transmits less heat, uh, and doesn't get as hot as fast. In order to accommodate, uh, say, use of the pistol with gloves, uh, the trigger guard was also enlarged. If we compare our, P our standard P7, or PSP here, to the M8, you can see that the trigger guard uh, is, is both dropped down, you can see the angle there, and it's extended forward more. So, Larger trigger guard makes it a little, a little more awkward to carry, uh, but it does also allow you to get a gloved finger in there with uh, a lot less chance of unintentionally pulling the trigger. HK was also selling these pistols on the civilian commercial market at that time, uh, and they did offer them either in a blued or a satin nickel finish. Uh, the nickel was a little more expensive, and to my mind, I, well, I don't really like nickel pistols. I think the blued looks better. By the way, on the M8, they will now have grips that are marked HK P7 M8, and the slides will also be marked M8 uh, to indicate that, that model, as well as the frames right down there. By the way, the New Jersey State Police quite liked the P7 M8, and they did go ahead and adopt it. However, one of the other issues that had come up through extended military and police testing was the magazine capacity. There were a lot of uh, agencies out there that didn't like the, the single stack eight round limitation. Now, there are again rationales both ways. So, a single stack mag has limited capacity. It's also a flatter and more concealable and more easily carried pistol. So, you kind of uh, take your pick and accept the consequences. Smaller gun with fewer rounds, or a bulkier gun with more rounds. Uh, and HK's answer to this was to introduce a double stack version of the gun, the P7M13. And that's what we have here. These two look virtually identical from the side, but when we look at them from the bottom, you can see the obvious difference. The M13 with its double stack magazine is a lot wider than the P7M8. In pretty much all other ways, the M13 would remain the same as the M8. It has the same heat upgrades here, it maintains the exact same mechanical system, the same squeeze cocking system. It maintains the same magazine release as the M8. Uh, they just uh, went to a double stack magazine. Interesting to note that in order to maintain the same basic slide geometry, they had to continue to use a single stack or a single feed magazine. So the way they did this magazine is to have it taper well before it actually gets to the very top so that in the slide portion they're dealing with the same geometry. Uh, this meant that in a, magaz a magazine that maybe typically on other guns of the period could hold 15 rounds, in the P7 this was a 13 round magazine, hence the designation. 
you can see the size difference here from the back as well. The slides are the same, but the frame on the M13 is quite a bit wider. This did mean that the slides are actually interchangeable between the M8 and the M13, but of course M13 pistols are going to be marked M13, as you can see here on the slide, and the frame. These other marks, by the way, the IE is a date code. Uh, this is a German proof mark, as is the Eagle over N. So this one is a quite early example, serial number, well, prototype serial number 19. Uh, this isn't the sort of thing you would normally find uh, on the market for sale, but we have it here because we're taking a look at these in the grey room. Standard markings on the other side of the slide, Heckler and Koch, uh, GmbH 9x19, Oberndorf, etc, etc, etc. Now there is one other pattern that's kind of interesting that I want to show you. These are very, very rare on the commercial market because they were only made for a very limited clientele of honestly, of people who really didn't understand what the benefits were of the mechanical system here. The idea is this gives you a remarkable level of safety in a striker-fired pistol, because there's no way that this lever is going to accidentally engage. This really does take a substantial amount of force to engage. Now, it's relatively easy to hold it once you have it engaged, uh, but kind of like a double-action revolver trigger, this, this provides plenty of mechanical safety for the gun, um, especially combined with the actual trigger. However, there were some military and police clients that just had this knee-jerk reaction to, we must have a manual safety. And so HK did in fact oblige them and come out with a manual safety version of the P7. This is the P7 M8S. I believe there was also an M13 version of it. Why not? It's easy enough to add to both. And it just has this additional lever uh, for a well, sliding switch to go between safe and full. And that just blocks the trigger. So it's really an afterthought. It's completely unnecessary because of the basic working principles of the gun. But for those countries, uh, the one I know of offhand was the Mexican military, which bought like 3,000 of these. They insist on a safety, so Okay, if you insist, we'll put a safety on the gun, even though it doesn't need it. I know people are going to bring this up, so I'm going to mention it here briefly. There is one other gun in the P7 standard family, and that's the P7K3. And this is basically the subcaliber uh, HK P7, made uh, with a, a variety of barrel conversion kits in uh, 32 ACP, 380, and 22 rimfire. However, the one that they have here is missing a couple of internal parts, and this is mechanically distinct from the rest of, uh, of the, the guns. So we're going to go ahead and cover this with its complete uh, interchangeable set of barrels and magazines in a separate video later on. One of the main reasons that this wasn't more widely adopted by German police agencies was the cost, of course. And that's also one of the major hurdles to its widespread popularity and sale here on the United States commercial market. Uh, it's interesting that these guns actually started out very competitive with uh, some of the other pistols on the market. So for example, in 1986, the, uh, the dealer price on a P7 M8 was $469, or $459. The dealer price on a Beretta 92 from Beretta was $499. So in fact at that time a P7 M13 had the exact same dealer price as a Beretta 92, really on par. However, over the next 5 to 10 years, HK would make kind of make some changes in how it wanted to market the pistols, and there would be fairly substantial price jumps almost every year, until by the early 90s a P7 was going to cost you between $800 and $1,000. And at that point, the price is really getting to be substantially higher than some of its other competitors. That was deliberate on HK's part, but it's kind of part of that marketing strategy that's given HK a bit of an elitist reputation, where, you know, they could have sold these guns cheaper, as we can see from the early pricing, but they didn't want to. They specifically wanted to focus on a higher-end clientele, and that led to this gun being, well, less popular. This is unfortunate because in many ways I think the P7 has a fantastic combination of technical characteristics that make it an outstanding carry pistol. Uh, 
and there are some of these that, that came back to kind of bite it, because the things that make a, a, a good carry pistol don't necessarily make for a good competition pistol, or a good practice and plinking pistol. The big one being the heating issue. So yeah, a P7 will, over, will, will heat up fairly quickly. And they did some work to ameliorate that with the M8 and the M13, but it kind of still remained a, a major, you know, a, a, a lasting lingering issue with the guns. The thing is, in a carry role, or in a police role, you're not really ever going to be in a situation where you're going to fire enough ammunition to actually see that problem manifest. It's only an issue of, I'm going to take this to you know, a, a big uh, major IPSC match, where I'm going to put 100 rounds through it on every stage. And yeah, it's going to be ridiculously hot by the end of every stage, and uncomfortable, and maybe it'll even burn my hand a bit. You know, burn the trigger finger if I touch the wrong part of the gun. That's the sort of thing that can really hurt the gun's marketability, but it's not actually a problem for the intended role. So uh, some of those issue issues certainly contributed to the P7 not, uh, not maybe getting its fair shake in the market. And of course the, uh, the squeeze cocking mechanism is quite unorthodox, and well, the American pistol market in particular isn't necessarily very friendly to unorthodox designs like that. So uh, you have to really convince people to put in the time and practice to get used to them. Uh, I actually have a friend who uh, shoots a P7 in, in two-gun competition on a somewhat regular basis, and it is remarkable what he can do with it. It is a very fast and very accurate gun. So um, unfortunately this is all kind of a moot point, because these have been uh, off the US market since bef since about 2000, all of them. Of course the M13 uh, pretty much left the US market in 94 as a result of the assault weapons ban, because it used a 13 round magazine. Uh, the, <laughs> there, there was a P7 M10, which we will cover in a separate video in 40 Smith & Wesson. Uh, that lasted a little bit into the mid 90s, but not very long. It was not a, not a very good gun. You'll, you'll see that in, in, when we cover that particular video. But, um, what we're left with is a, uh, a series of these three major models of the, the HK P7 that are really connoisseur and collector's pistols today. So hopefully you enjoyed this look through the whole family, and how they work, and how they developed. I'd like to thank HK for giving me access uh, to the Grey Room here to bring you this nice collection of different models of P7. And uh, definitely if you're interested, stick around for... we have a couple more videos coming up that will address a couple of specific um, outliers that weren't part of the standard production. Well, thanks for watching.